All right, we now arrive at the third and final installment of our long-winded lecture on atoms, molecules, and ions. And what can we possibly learn yet that we haven't already covered? Well, here it is. After today's lecture, you should be able to distinguish between ionic and molecular compounds, generate empirical formulas for ionic compounds, generate names for ionic and molecular compounds, memorize the following ions names and formulas, interconvert between ionic and molecular compounds names and formulas, and memorize the names and formulas of the following strong acids. But first, our chemistry cat of the day from quickmeme.com. OK, today's quick meme isn't actually a cat, but instead is a photo making fun of the naivety of college freshmen. Hence, I call this college freshman of the day. I like this particular one because the guy pictured here kind of looks like one of my brothers-in-law. Here it says, my first chem exam is tomorrow. I did fine in high school without studying. 12 out of 100. <laughs> uh, it's funny because it's true. And don't you forget it. You have to study to do well. <laughs> in our last lecture, we learned about the difference between ionic and covalent bonds. As discussed in their journey toward feeling like a noble gas, so when a metal and a non-metal bond, the metal more or less transfers its valence electron, or electrons, to the non-metal. This process forms two ions, a cation, which is a positively charged ion, and an anion, which is a negatively charged ion. This type of bond is called an ionic bond. In contrast, when two non-metals bond, they don't transfer electrons, but instead just share them to help each other feel like noble gases. This sharing can be very even and fair if the two atoms are more or less equally electronegative, or very imbalanced and one-sided if one atom is much more electronegative than the other. This type of bond is called a covalent bond. Which brings us to some cool new terms. Molecules that have all covalent bonds in them are called molecular compounds. Molecules that have all ionic bonds are called ionic compounds. So let's take a look at this problem. Of the choices below, which one is not an ionic compound? To answer this, we just have to look at each compound and ask ourselves, does this compound contain a metal bonded to a nonmetal? If so, then it has an ionic bond and is an ionic compound. If not, then it has only covalent bonds and is hence a molecular compound. I'll let you tackle this one on your own. So when a metal and a nonmetal get together to form an ionic compound, they have to do it in the right amount so that they balance out each other's charges. For example, let's pretend that we had a metal A with a charge of plus x getting together with a nonmetal B, which has a charge of minus y. How many A's will have to combine with how many B's to give us a balanced ionic formula? Although we could do some convoluted math here if we wanted to, there's a simpler way to generate an ionic compound's formula. Why, all we have to do is just use the x as a subscript for b and the y as a subscript for a. This gives us the formula of a subscript y, b subscript x, as indicated here. In doing this, we remove the negative and positive signs from x and y, since subscripts don't have negative or positive signs. Now, I hope that seems simple enough. If so, let's see if we can work out an example by going to the doc cam. For this problem that I've concocted, I'm going to ask you to predict the formula that would be made when sodium bonds with fluorine. Can you do it? You can go ahead and pause the video right now and see if you can attempt it on your own. And then if you wish, you can hit play, and I'll answer this for you. First things first, we have to figure out, looking at the periodic table, where sodium and fluorine are. As you look at the periodic table, you'll see that sodium, which has a formula of Na because its ancient Latin name was natrium or something like that, is located in group one of the periodic table. Whereas fluorine, which is located all the way over here to the right, is in column 7A. What charges are those two individual elements going to want when they form an ionic compound? Well, sodium being all the way to the left on the periodic table is going to want to give up one electron in order to feel like the nearest noble gas, which happens to be neon. Keep in mind that if an element loses electrons, it will move, as far as it feels at least, one box to the left for each electron that it loses. So sodium wants to have a plus one charge, which we'll write right here. 
Fluorine, on the other hand, is very close to neon, its nearest noble gas neighbor, but it needs to move to the right. So in order to feel like neon, it's going to have to move one position to the right, which means it's not going to lose electrons, it wants to gain electrons. So fluorine, in order to feel like neon, is going to want to gain one electron, so it's going to want to have a minus one charge. So what is the formula that's going to occur when these guys bond together? Well, they have equal charges, so to balance out, you just put them together in a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio, so it's going to be sodium fluoride. However, there uh, is another trick that I just showed you. You take the charge of one, and it becomes the subscript of the other, and vice versa. So we could rewrite this then as being Na1F1. Or the ones uh, are implied if you take them out of subscript. So that is the formula, NaF of this compound. This one's a little trick. You're bonding magnesium with nitrogen. Let's take a look at the periodic table. Find those elements and figure out what charges they're going to want to have. As you can see, magnesium is in column uh, two of the periodic table, which means that in order to feel like the nearest noble gas, it wants to shift to the left. So it's going to lose electrons. How many electrons does it have to lose in order to shift to the left to its nearest noble gas neighbor, which happens to be neon? Well, because it's in column two, it has to shift two to the left. So magnesium is going to want to have a charge of plus two by getting rid of its two valence electrons. Now let's look at nitrogen. Nitrogen, as you can see, is in column 5A of the periodic table. Its nearest noble gas neighbor is also neon, but it's not going to want to shift to the left. See, if it wants to shift to the left by losing electrons, it's going to have to lose five electrons to feel like helium. It'd be much easier to just gain some electrons shifting to the right to feel like neon. So nitrogen, then, is going to gain three electrons in an ionic compound, so it's going to want to have a charge of N3 minus. What kind of formula uh, is going to be uh, created when these two uh, atoms bond together? Well, the way we do that, simply, is uh, we take the superscript charge of one and turn it into subscript of the other, and vice versa. So in order to have a balanced charge, the final formula is going to be Mg3N2. Now, if you think about that, that sort of makes sense, because keep in mind that magnesium, each magnesium atom here, has a charge of plus two. And there are three of them. So altogether, the total positive charge they give off is equal to plus six. In contrast, nitrogen, each nitrogen atom has a charge of negative three, and there are two of them. So each of them, or sorry, so together, the total negative charge they uh, give is negative six. Positive six and negative six balance each other out, giving an overall zero or neutral charge for this compound. So that is indeed the formula that is made when magnesium bonds to nitrogen. So let's see if you can do this problem on your own. Predict the empirical formula of the ionic compound that forms from magnesium and fluorine. And here's another one. The charge on the copper ion in the salt, CuO, is what?